I'm Vanessa, the Associate Editor of Book Riot, and I'm back with another new Release Tuesday video. First up today is The Long Petal of the Sea by Isabel Allende, an author you may have heard of. This is a piece of historical fiction that opens in the 1930s in Spain, just as General Franco has overthrown the city. Hundreds and thousands are forced to flee on this really treacherous journey over the mountains to escape, and we meet a young pregnant widow named Roser. Although that's probably pronounced Roser, since it's based in Spain, I'm gonna go with Roser. She finds that her life is intertwined with that of Victor Dalmau, who happens to be her deceased husband's brother. And they end up entering into sort of a marriage of convenience that neither of them really wants, but that both of them needs to survive. Together with 2,000 other refugees, they embark on a trip on the SS Winnipeg, a ship chartered by poet Paulo Neruda to Chile. There they'll embrace exile as the rest of Europe erupts into a world war, but also find hope in the struggle that one day they will no longer be exiles again and hopefully get to return to Spain. If you've managed not to read Isabel Allende yet, then you may not know that she is just this amazing weaver of epic stories that yank, like pull, destroy your heartstrings, and also teach you a lot about a specific era in history. She is a, a Chilean writer that I so admire. Um, House of the Spirits is another excellent example of how she weaves historical fiction with a story that just like undoes you. So I'm very excited to pick this one up. So if you're a lover of historical fiction, of Latinx writing, of Isabel Allende in general, then pick this one up. Next is Homie, a poetry collection from Danez Smith. This book is described as a magnificent anthem to the saving power of friendship in a collection that's rooted in the loss of several of Danez Smith's close friends. It's about searching for joy and intimacy in a world where both of those are becoming scarcer and scarcer. Smith acknowledges that it can be very difficult to take up space in a world that is seemingly defined by disparity, by violence, by xenophobia, and specifically to take up space in a body that's defined by blackness, by queerness, by diagnosis. But they describe the beautiful, poignant, and very simple joy of, you know, in the midst of the mire of all the bad things to look up and see that your phone has lit up with a message or hear a shout from the window from someone that you love, from a you know friend or family member, both blood and chosen, showing up at your door with a delicious piece of food to eat, all about finding joy in dark spaces and in retaining hope in a world that threatens to weigh you down. I first started paying attention to or was made aware of Denez Smith when they won the, or they were nominated, pardon me, for the 2018 National Book Award for their collection, Don't Call Us Dead. And that sent me down a rabbit hole on looking up their YouTube slam poetry performances. I highly encourage you to do that to get a sense of their particular style, which is, yeah, this awesome blend of hopeful and funny and honest and fresh and just so entertaining to watch. So pick up this collection, go back and look up the rest of their stuff and then check out their performances too. You won't be sorry. Next is Riot Baby by Tochi Onyebuchi. This is a science fiction novella that has been on my list for some time. That sounds like one of those that's gonna make me go. So the two main characters are Ella and her brother Kev. Ella has a thing. She sees a classmate grow up to be a caring nurse. She sees another boy in her school be, you know, murdered in a terrible drive-by shooting. She sees things before they've happened. Her brother Kev was born in the middle of the LA riots, I believe right around the time that police were acquitted in the Rodney King case. And when he himself is incarcerated in another act of police brutality, Ella finds herself torn trying to determine what it means to watch her brother be in prison to try to bring him some kind of faith and hope with this gift that she possesses to communicate with him psychically while she possesses in her hands the very power to just wreck cities to the ground. This is a piece of political speculative fiction that explores that space where hope lives inside of anger. It's both an intimate family story and a global dystopian narrative and the part in the description for this book that really made me want to read it is it's described as providing these devastatingly quiet reflections on love, on fury, and the Black experience. Something about that sentence just absolutely hooked me. I have said before that I really enjoy stories that take a really big global issue and distill them down to particulars because, I mean, Hopefully as humans, we are concerned with these big topical issues in general because they're important, but I think it helps us relate to them on a whole new level when we get to distill them down to like the specific characters and individuals. So can't wait to dive into this, but it sounds like it's gonna be a heck of a read from everyone I've spoken to has read it, but also a very important one. 
Next is The Majesties by Tiffany Sow. This is their debut piece of literary fiction. It's also a bit of a mystery thriller. This book has been out definitely in Australia and potentially in the UK, but it is just now being published here in the US. In it, we meet sisters Gwendolyn and Estella who have been as close as sisters could possibly be. They've grown up in this very wealthy, very powerful, eminent family that's often also very deceitful. They've relied on each other for support and confidence. But then Gwendolyn is lying in a coma and she's lying in a coma because Estella poisoned every last member of their clan and she is the lone survivor. As she struggles to regain consciousness, she's trying to, you know, piece together <laughs> what the heck happened. How did she get here? How did this person who she trusted so implicitly not only do this to her, but to everyone they know and love. To get to the truth, she'll have to confront some pretty devastating truths about the family and that reveal a lot more than she expected about who and her sister really are. This book does a lot of traveling to different parts of the world. And that's part of what got me like, ooh, in addition to the fact that it sounds like a really engaging and fun, you know, mystery to solve. It starts off in these, you know, rich and opulent places in Indonesia and then jumps to Paris Fashion Week, to the university scene in Melbourne, to the California coast, all with this amazing story of, you know, family treachery and secrets weaving it all together. So if you're a fan of all of those things or just are looking for a great page turner to pass the time, who isn't, that's why you're here, <laughs> then pick that one up. Next is The Seep by Chana Porter, which is a piece of science fiction. Our main character is Trina, who is a trans woman living in a society, and this is my favorite part, where a gentle alien invasion has taken place. If we ever do have an alien invasion, I too hope that it is gentle. Gentle though it may be, it definitely changes everything about their world. Capitalism falls or fails, uh, hierarchies and barriers are broken down. It's just a really big mess that eventually makes things better. Trina and her wife Diva are living a very blissful life in this new, you know, post gentle alien invasion world. When it gets into Diva's head that she would like to be reborn as a baby and live an even better life. And this may sound a little, but it's actually quite possible in this world that they now live in where essentially anything that can be imagined is possible. She becomes sort of obsessed with this idea and then decides to do that very thing, essentially leaving Trina all alone. Trina is heartbroken and devastated and turns to alcohol for some solace. And then she encounters a young boy who is sort of lost and she follows him to try to help him and embarks on this very unexpected quest. And then thus the story turns into this particular journey where she's trying to save him from the seep as they call it, all while trying to navigate the terrifying boy that was left in her life when Diva left her side. This sounds like a really interesting elegy and like reflection on grief and moving on and what it's like to be alienated, like what it means to be alienated, all with this, you know, gentle alien invasion in the background that I can't seem to move on from. I really love the idea that it was like, we're just gonna burn everything down, but we're gonna be gentle about it. So yeah, if you like science fiction and are looking for an interesting meditation on Othering, love, loss, grief. This sounds like one that you'll need to add to your TBR. And last today is The Third Rainbow Girl, The Long Life of a Double Murder in Appalachia by Emma Copley Eisenberg. This is a work of true crime that is about what's known as the Rainbow Murders case. It is based on a murder that took place in 1980 in Pocahontas County, Virginia. Three young women were hitchhiking on their way to a festival known as the Rainbow Gathering when two of the young women were murdered, one survived. For 13 years, no one was prosecuted for this case, but deep suspicion was cast on the locals who were all painted as poor, dangerous, and backward, you know, lots of stereotypes. Then in 1993, a local farmer was convicted for the murders, only for that conviction to be overturned shortly thereafter when a serial killer and diagnosed schizophrenic claimed responsibility for the murders. Years passed, the story sort of fell out of a lot of people's consciousness, the truth sort of seemed to slip away, you know, with that passage of time, and Emma Copley Eisenberg decided to go back to Pocahontas County and spent some time living there, re-examined everything about the case to try to get a better understanding for what happened and for the trauma that it left behind in this, this part of the world that 
where you know these murders confirmed the violence that outsiders bring to the area. This sounds like a complex history of Appalachia and it's described as a wide-ranging portrait of America that deals with gender and class divides as well as its violence. I like a piece of true crime that does what this book seems to set out to do, which is to examine how this particular by act of you know violence or just any kind of crime speaks more to a larger issue within that region, population, group of people, community, etc. So if that's the kind of true crime that you're into, then you should definitely pick this up as well. That's all I've got for you this week. Make sure to tune in next time for another new release Tuesday video. And in the meantime, enjoy all the reads.